up over my head I hear music in the air up over my head I hear music in the air and I really do believe yes I really do believe change is coming out there up over my head I see justice in the air Up over my head I see justice in the air Up over my head I see justice in the air And I really do believe Yes, I really do believe Change is coming out there Up over my head I see hope is in the air Up over my head I see hope is in the air Up over my head I see hope is in the air I really do believe, yes, I really do believe change is coming out there. Up over my head, I see changes in the air. Up over my head, I see changes in the air. Up over my head, I see changes. I really do believe, yes, I really do believe change is coming out there. Up over my head, I see love all around us. Up over my head, I see peace everywhere. Up over my head, I see sheer determination. Up over my head, I see joy. I see justice up over. I see healing, I see hope up over our heads. I see power to the people up over my head. I had a fast car. Up over my head. Oh. Yeah. So sure my Well. Welcome to the March meeting of the Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign. We are glad to have you all here. We are glad to all have you all here. We are going to do consecutive interpretation. We'll start first in English, then Spanish for a few minutes. We will also have interpretation in ASL tonight. Hola, bienvenidas y bienvenidos a la reunión estatal de, de marzo de la campaña de la gente pobre. Estamos muy contentos de tenerles aquí. Al principio haremos interpretación consecutiva. Primero se hablará en inglés, luego en español por unos minutos. También tendremos interpretación en ASL esta noche. First, we'd like to ask everyone to use the renaming feature so we can all get to know each other a little, little bit better. Please take a minute now to add your name and pronouns. And to do this, go to participants, click your name, right click for Windows and select rename or hover over your thumbnail on the gallery. Click the three dots in the upper right hand corner and select rename. If this is your first meeting, please add an asterisk next to your name. Primero nos gustaría pedirles que usemos el nombre de pantalla para conocernos un poco mejor. Por favor, ponga su nombre y pronombre, si usa él, ella o ella, para uh, hacer esto, vaya a participante, haga clic en su nombre, clic derecho en Windows, y seleccione cambiar nombre o colocar 
que el cursor sobre su imagen haga clic en los tres puntos en la esquina superior derecha y seleccione cambiar nombre. Si, es, eh, si esta es su primera re reunión con nosotros, agregue un asterisco junto a su nombre. Ahora, pa para facilitar el lenguaje, le pido que si español es su lenguaje de preferencia, encienda el micrófono y diga su nombre um, para que también podamos uh, anotar uh, su preferencia de lenguaje. Our meeting is multilingual, Spanish, English, and ASL. I want to introduce our interpreters, Leo, Ana, and Mary. Please come off mute and say hello. Hey, y'all. Hola, mi nombre es Ana. Estoy en, en Norristown, Pennsylvania, con, aquí con la campaña de los pobres en Pennsylvania. Mucho gusto. Hi, my name is Mary, uh, pronouns say them, and I uh, have a background in uh, interpretation uh, in a church setting. Now we will make our interpretation. Sorry. Now we will make our interpretation announcement first in English, then Spanish. Listen carefully because the, there are instructions that everyone will have to follow. Ahora haremos nuestra, um, nuestro anuncio de interpretación. Primero en inglés y luego en español. Por favor, preste atención porque hay instrucciones que todos tienen que seguir. The Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign understands the strategic importance of and is committed to creating multilingual spaces when possible. We are organizing across all lines of division, including language. To that end, we have interpretations in Spanish, English, and ASL. We ask that all participants speak slowly and clearly. Right after this announcement, we will activate the Zoom interpretation feature. Parts of our meeting will be in English and other parts in Spanish. So everyone, please make sure to follow these instructions. If you are using Zoom from your computer, you will see a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Click on the globe and select your computer. You will see a globe icon at the bottom of the screen. Select your, sorry, click on the globe and select your preferred language. If you're using Zoom from your phone, click on the three dots where it says more, choose language interpretation and select your preferred language. If you prefer ASL, you can use the screen for your interpreter. Please place the letter A near your name so you can have access to ASL in your breakout room. If you have any problems doing this, please comment in the chat so one of our members can assist you. Thank you. La campaña de la gente pobre de Wisconsin entiende la importancia estratégica y tiene la firme determinación de crear un espacio multilingüe y de unirnos a través del lenguaje. Con esta finalidad, tenemos interpretación en español, en inglés y también en ASL. Les pedimos a todos los participantes que hablen lentamente y de forma clara. A, ter a terminar este anuncio, activaremos la función de interpretación de Zoom. Y si usted está usando Zoom en su computadora, podrá ver un icono de un mundo en la parte de abajo de su pantalla. Haga clic en el mundo y seleccione el lenguaje de su preferencia. Si está usando Zoom desde su teléfono, Haga clic en los tres puntitos donde dice more o más. Seleccione language interpretation o interpretación de lenguaje de idiomas y luego su lenguaje. Si tiene algún problema, ponga un comentario en el chat y uno de nuestros miembros le ayudará. Gracias. We will now turn on that interpretation feature. Thank you to our interpreters and tech team, and a special welcome to anyone who is new to the Poor People's Campaign. If this is your 
first meeting with us. Um, we are glad you are here and we are eager to know you and learn what brought you to the campaign. My name is Sally and I live in Edgerton. I am chair of the Rock County PPC and a member of our coordinating committee. I will be emceeing the meeting tonight along with my friend and another leader of the Poor People's Campaign, Reverend Ari Douglas. Tonight we will begin Kelly, with an interpretation. I'm, I'm just gonna pause you so that we can check the interpretation before we go on. So sure. Um, let's just pause for one minute so that everybody can go ahead and um, add the, their language. You should be able to see the globe now at the bottom. Um, if you are using your, I'll repeat one more time, just that if you're using your phone, um, you can click on the three dots and select more. And now you should have um, the option for language interpretation to select your um, preferred language. And I'm just gonna check now. Okay, and we can continue. Please feel free to message in the chat if you need any help. Okay. Tonight, we will begin with an invocation and land recognition uh, acknowledgement from uh, Rabbi Bonnie Argolos. Then we will have the wonderful opportunity to hear from the Reverend Liz Theo Harris, co-chair of the National Poor People's Campaign. After her inspiring words, we will get more inspiration from individuals in Wisconsin who have been impacted by environmental degradation, poverty, and racism. Finally, we will show you ways to get involved in the movement to change these issues. Now I will pass it over to Rabbi Marvelous. Thank you. Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice, which is the organization I run, is based in Madison, but we are a statewide organization, as is the Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign. As people of faith committed to justice for all peoples, we acknowledge that we are situated on the indigenous lands of the Menominee, Ojibwa, Ho-Chunk, Potawatomi, Sauk and Meskwaki, Kickapoo, and other nations who cherish this place. We make this acknowledgement to honor the history, culture, traditions, and rich legacy of the native peoples who have lived here and who continue to live here and contribute to our society. We further make this acknowledgement as one small piece of ongoing efforts to end the erasure of their contributions and of the true history of how the United States was formed. We will continue to lift up Native American rights and issues in our work and to reach out in allyship with the indigenous nations in Wisconsin. We gather here this evening in the spirit of solidarity and unity across races, ethnicities, faith traditions, gender expressions, ages, and abilities. We are united in our passion for justice, our commitment to equity, and our conviction that together we can create the world that we want to see. This week, Jews around the world read the first five chapters of Leviticus. This Torah portion details the different types of sacrifices the ancient Israelites were to bring to the temple in atonement for a variety of unintentional sins. Sacrifice was central to the ancient Israelite worship. But already by the time of the prophets, it was recognized that animal sacrifice was not the sole or necessarily the best way for human beings to engage in partnership with the divine in the ongoing work of creation, of perfecting this world that we have been given. The prophet Micah tells us, with what shall I approach God, do homage to God on high? Shall I approach God with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? God has told you, O human, what is good and what God requires of you, only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk modestly with your God. And in case we didn't know, Leviticus 19 explains what it means to do justice, to provide food for the hungry, to be honest in business, to be just in the courts of law, 
to be respectful to the blind and deaf and elderly, to treat the stranger among us the same as the citizen, to speak up when your neighbor bleeds, and most of all, to love your neighbor as yourself. The words of Micah and the teachings of Leviticus guide us still today. As we move forward together in the holy work of justice, let us gather strength from one another, inspiration from wise leaders, and hope from the knowledge that future generations will learn from and build upon our work. Kenihi Ratzon, may this be God's will. Good evening. Uh, I think uh, we're beginning with our testifiers first and then moving to uh, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, who will be joining us uh, soon. Uh, so I'd like to introduce, introduce Laura. Laura is a single mother of three living in Wausau, uh, where she works as a caregiver at home. She is speaking to the uh, rele uh, relevation, uh, sorry, revelation that all city wells have been contaminated by PFAS slash PFO uh, PFOS above levels uh, deemed safe by the Department of Health Services. This information has been known for over two years. I'm left feeling angry and uncertain. There are many unanswered questions and a lot of mixed messages from different sources. We need uniform guidance from our city leaders. I haven't seen that yet. When we found out, we stopped drinking the water. Some people have not and will not unless there are clear guidelines and information. I think action needs to happen sooner rather than later. Do something now even if it's short-term or temporary fixes. I feel the public should have been made aware of this two years ago when it was first known. I have lost trust. I'm concerned about the long-term health outcomes. My son is immune compromised. I read that one of the outcomes could be vaccines not working as well. I am left wondering if one of my daughter's health issues could have been caused by this. That is a terrible thing to wonder. I wonder how long we have been drinking, cooking with, and using this contaminated water. My children and many children in the city had and have their formula prepared with city water. I am left wondering. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'd like to introduce Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, co-chair of the National uh, Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Um, wonderful uh, spiritual leader and uh, uh, someone who has seen and been with all of us in the struggle. Uh, Reverend Dr. Liz, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for that powerful testimony um, and for gathering us all here today. Um, so yeah, um, Wisconsin is my home state and I have a deep and great love for the state. Um, and I'm therefore so proud of the powerful organizing that the Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign is doing. And so looking forward to being in Wisconsin at the end of this month for a mobilization tour towards this mass poor, low wage, poor people and low wage workers assembly and moral march on Washington. Um, so this evening I wanted to think a little bit uh, with you all about why we 
as Wisconsinites, need to mobilize, we need to organize, we need to register, we need to engage people for a movement, um, and we need to declare to this nation. Um, now, next month, in May, and then on June 18th, um, and then going forward, uh, that we will not be silent, um, that we must have uh, a transformation, a reconstruction of the society from the bottom up, and that we know that we, uh, poor and low income people, moral leaders, clergy, activists, advocates, are exactly the people uh, who can push way towards change. Um, I mean, I don't need to tell folks in Wisconsin about why we need to organize and unite. Um, uh, you all here on this call already know about the the, the housing crisis, the eviction crisis, the, the lack of affordable housing across the state. You on this call already know about um, all of the students that are in debt across the state of Wisconsin um, who uh, are about to have to start paying um, not just uh, their regular monthly payments, but for years now uh, because of this pandemic. Um, and, and folks just do not have the resources. You all already know about the family farm crisis and the dairy farm crisis in the state and how so many folks um, you know, have not been able to receive any relief or if, if folks did receive those first payments um, that still um, across the state, um, our, our farmers, um, our dairy farmers, um, uh, in the great state of Wisconsin are just struggling. You all already know about, uh, you know, the, the politics of our state, um, a state that uh, someone like Ron Johnson is not uh, an anomaly to, um, uh, but that we, we know that we need to rise up for voting rights and protect and defend this democracy, and, and that the, the connection between the attack on our democracy and the kind of divide and conquer politics of, of so many Wisconsin politicians have on the impact of, of poor and low-income people. Um, and, and you all already know all about, uh, you know, whether it's the, the lack of, of adequate health care and the fact that, you know, across the state folk need to be making more than $24 an hour and yet the the minimum wage is 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 far 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 from that um, and so again just really uh, uh, pleased and excited to be with with you all as as we you know both hear from people across Wisconsin that are impacted um, and then figure out how we move forward and organize together um, uh, I think many people here know a number of my favorite Dr. King quotes, but I've been thinking a lot about the need um, to unite and organize poor and low income people and, and really unsettle the kind of complacency of, uh, you know, allowing for, as we've been hearing from Reverend Dr. Barber, the other co-chair of the campaign, who are reaching 1 million deaths from COVID nearly 1 million people. And early on in this pandemic, Columbia University said, before they even had the vaccines, that 60% of, of the deaths from COVID were completely unnecessary. And since then, um, you know, with, uh, you know, even, even more. Um, so we've had close to 1 million people die. And yet uh, we haven't paused as a nation to, to mourn for a day or for two days or for a week. Um, and, and we know that that's possible because before COVID even hit, we had gotten used to death. Um, that when 700 people a day um, die from poverty and inequality in the richest country in human history, when we're used to a quarter of a million people dying just because they cannot access healthcare and living wage jobs and adequate housing and, and other basic necessities that we have the resources for, but do not have the political will and moral consciousness to get it done. When, when that was already the society that we are living in before COVID hit, and then COVID has only deepened and further exposed these fissures, we know that the solution to this is for us to organize. 
and and not for us to wait for others to to come and save us but to come forward and say that we uh the millions of poor and low-income people in this nation um can and are taking action together um and through this we are able to be this a new and unsettling force um that can wake up the consciousness of our of our nation and and actually not just put forward a vision of what could be done but but the steps to get it done and build up that power and make it so um and so that's why we are building this campaign and that's why it is so important for us to have uh, a, a gathering uh, an assembly a, a moral march where we put forward um Again, uh, not just the pain, but you know who will be front and center uh, on June 18th, as is true in all Poor People's Campaign events. Who will be front and center are poor and impacted folk. Um, but not just telling our sad stories, not just saying, isn't this a shame that it's things like this are going on, but putting forward the solutions that are at hand, that have come out of organizing, come out of our grassroots communities, um, that are there in our third reconstruction agenda, that are there in the poor people's moral budget that we've put together. We have the solutions, we know how to get it done, and now we have to build the kind of political will to do so. And so we look back in history in this country and across the world and we see that when uh people's rights are being denied um and and when a movement is breaking through it needs generationally transformative gatherings it needs a, a meeting where folk can come out into the public square and make it so clear that Somebody's been hurting our people. It's gone on for far too long and we're not gonna be silent anymore. And that is what June is about. And that's why uh, all of our organizing is about. And that's what we will keep on, on trying to build as, as we move forward. Now, I wanna step back for a minute and, and just think a little bit about the power of people taking action together um, and, and the impact that it has had and can have and is is currently having um, on our national politic. Um, so if we if we look at at different moments of US history, it's exactly when people say things cannot change, things cannot be better, right? Uh, you know, right after the Dred Scott decision, um, that's when Frederick Douglass comes forward and says, um, that this is going to embolden our agitation and that we're going to have to keep on on building for, farther and, and building stronger. And, and this is becomes a, a key turning point in the abolitionist movement, um, building the power and unity of those who had been enslaved with others who realized the scourge of slavery could be no more. And, and that was the beginning of the ending of slavery. Right. Uh, it's it's. It's we were just celebrating or commemorating or remembering a bloody Sunday um, when when folk were, were beaten on that Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, uh, Alabama, on March seventh um, of nineteen sixty five, um, and and it was in front of the world um, where Amelia Boynton Robinson was left bloodied and battered unconscious on that bridge um, uh, with with uh, law enforcement and and white supremacists who who were there and they said to let the vultures come get her um, but out of that she not only got up uh, but but others got up and kept on fighting kept on organizing so right when folks said this is a desperate situation. Uh, change cannot come is exactly when uh, change has to come and when the people who are most impacted make it come. That's a similar situation that we're having right now. Folk are, are feeling desperate in this moment, desperate because it's been years 
of a pandemic and we haven't expanded healthcare. It's been the renaming, as Dr. Barbara says, of, of essential workers, but, but still paying people expendable wages. It's been, uh, you know, continued um, police brutality, immigrant injustice, uh, attacks on women and queer people and trans people, and it just keeps going. And it seems like it is too much. Um, and it seems like it's not possible to change anything. But I have, I'm here to tell you that coming out of, of Selma, Alabama, and coming out of other parts across the country, and coming out of Wausau, Wisconsin, and Madison, Wisconsin, and, and uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and all over the state um, is the good news that it does not have to be this way. And, and that in fact, we are building the kind of power to be able to, in the words of Dr. King, make the power structure say yes, when they may be desirous of saying no. And so this is how change happens. This is what it looks like. And this is why we need all of y'all to keep on organizing, keep on mobilizing, uh, build a, a mighty mass meeting of people, both in Wisconsin, in March, in April, in May, and, and pull those people um, to be proud to be in the numbers as the saints go marching in into Washington, D.C. for this mighty kind of moral resurrection of our, our deepest values of love and truth and justice and peace and peace in this time um, when we have so much violence, so much war, so much fear. And so, again, just really pleased to be amongst y'all. Cannot wait to be um, back in my hometown. Um, and and in my home state um and and cannot wait to continue to connect with many of you some of you we've been working together for years now um and some of y'all we're, we're just getting to know each other but but what i do know is that even though i didn't know everybody you know last week or the week before i know that we have been put into this gathering together um for a reason and that's because we can make a difference, not just in our lives, not just in our families' lives, in our communities' lives, but in, in our state's life, in our nation's life, in our, in our international life. Um, because it's the only thing that ever has is when people come together and, and, and have the kind of moral direct action um, and, uh, and declaration of, of life over death, um, that that is when. Uh, things can change. And so just really excited to be here. Um, going to have a chance to be, um, uh, you know, in, in this conversation, in this meeting for a little longer. Um, but, but, but thanks for having me here. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Liz. Uh, we are so excited to welcome you back home um, in, uh, in just a few weeks. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your uh, powerful words. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll go ahead and move to uh, Freddy uh, Corillo. Freddy is a leader with Vecinos Unidos, a group that organizes for the dignity and human rights of folk in uh, the south side of Milwaukee. He draws from years of experience fighting for the humanity of migrant workers in Vermont. Uh, Freddy Lee, uh, lives with partner uh, Sarah, who's also one of our uh, uh, tri-chairs and, and uh, great Great movement leader, uh, and their four kids who are movement leaders in uh, the uh, in the creation. Uh, Freddie, actually, um, first of all, I'm going to pause and interrupt as the language leader. We're going to switch interpretation um, so that Anna can have a break. If Leo, if you are able to take over for a little bit, um, and uh, uh, Freddie is parenting a bit at the moment and we'll um, join in a bit. So if we could go to one of the other um, uh, testifiers and he will be here soon. Absolutely. So we'll just take a very short moment. And uh, when, uh, when we are ready to go, uh, Sarah, if you'll just let me know. Rev, already, do you want to introduce Carl? 
Uh, I was going to introduce you, but yeah, uh, let me find Carl. Oh, I'm listening, Reverend. Um, I'm I'm looking for your introduction. I'm sorry. There we go. Um, so uh, Carl Fields is joining us. For, uh, should I go ahead and start, or are are we still waiting for interpret interpretation? We're ready on interpretation. Okay, thank you. So Carl Fields is uh, joining us from uh, from Racine. He is the community organizer for Expo, and tonight. He will speak about his experience with voting rights. Carl, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, uh, and and thank you for having me, everybody. Um, uh, like you said, I'm, I'm from Racine, um, from the Racine Kenosha Chapter of Expo, uh, which stands for uh, Ex-Incarcerated People Organizing. Uh, I've done, you know, work and partner with uh, with uh, Poor People's Campaign in the past, and so you know, I know the work. Um, I also come to this space as a uh, real transcriptionist, and so I have a particular understanding of blind deaf culture, um, you know, that I'm uh, both respectful of and an advocate of, and so inclusiveness is, is certainly a part of what I do in addition to uh, being a directly impacted person. I wanted to take a, a few moments uh, to talk to you about uh, what Unlock the Vote is. And Unlock the Vote for us is about um, people having a say in their community in, in the state of Wisconsin uh, in relation to criminal justice. There are multiple states that when you are no longer in a building or in a facility or in a prison that you have a right to have a say in the community because you spend money in the community, you pay taxes, uh, you should have a say in where that money and where those resources go. You should have a say in where your kids go to school or your grandkids go to school. And, and that particular focus for us is one of the most pro-social tools that uh, the criminal legal system has in Wisconsin. And it's not used appropriately. It's not used in a way that is bringing people home better. It's not helping people to, uh, as we would say, merge with traffic and become fully functioning people again. And so the hard part for us in Unlock the Vote is that we're pushing for people to be acknowledged as whole and complete persons in the community. Uh, it, it has legs. This is not some unprecedented thing that we're asking for. It is connected to uh, uh, several bills that have been supported and, and drafted and have been put forward in the state. Um, Senator Lena Taylor is one of the co-sponsors of that uh, particular bill that's been drafted. Um, uh, Representative Jody Emerson is the other. Uh, Crowley is another. Bowen is another. Uh, they've been supportive of uh, Unlock the Vote in state legislation for some time now. And so we launched a campaign around that. And what we're doing is trying to bring people together uh, with, with great inclusiveness because there are entire communities that have been system impacted that have uh, been justice impacted uh, because these are heavy police neighborhoods. These are people who have been disenfranchised for a number of different reasons and criminal justice has a way of permanently putting people on the outs and in the margins. And so one of the things that we are promoting is our people in politics campaigns around the state, which is bringing uh, to bear and bringing people to the forefront who are living that truth. Uh, the latest one or the next one is uh, coming up in Kenosha uh, on March 14th, and and so it'll be at uh, at uh, Alvin Barbershop for those who are familiar with Kenosha, and his shop is called the Regiment uh, Barber Collective, and it'll be from 12 to 4. And so for anybody who is uh, supportive of directly impacted people or indirectly impacted themselves. Uh, or just believe in the human decency of recovery and redemption and the ability for people to come back uh, and be welcomed back with dignity and respect to their communities, come on out and see it. And, you know, uh, multiple electeds and those who aspire to be elected have been 
uh, invited. If they show, they show. If they don't, I'm happy to see people who are living this, both through their experience and through their values to come out and be with us. Happy to have you come out uh, and happy to, uh, again, partner with you in the work because we all want the same thing. And thank, thank, thank you for hearing me out, everybody. Carl, we really appreciate your being here. We, uh, we appreciate your leadership and uh, your invitation. Uh, and I know that, uh, that at least myself and I hope many others will be taking you up on that invitation. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce now uh, Jade Livingston. Late Jade Livingston lives in Northern Wisconsin and is from the Bad River Res uh, Reservation. Uh, they are the digital organizer for Progress North. Uh, they will be speaking tonight about uh, their experience with Blind Five. Jade, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you all for having me. Um, like uh, you shared, I'm here to speak on Line Five. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, line Five is a pipeline um, that runs through the Bad River Reservation, where I'm from. Um, and uh, it has been on the reservation for a good number of years. Um, and in 2018, the tribe uh, denied uh, an easement for Enbridge to remain on the reservation. Um, and in 2019, the tribe filed a lawsuit against Enbridge um, for continuing to be on the reservation after denying that easement. Um, and Enbridge's response to that has been to submit multiple um, proposed reroutes um, that still run through the Bad River watershed. Um, and so what that means is that any construction operation um, or failure of the pipeline will um, damage our watershed, which is long, long reaching. Um, and we're in a very unique area in the north here where we have um, very unique wetlands, very rare um, wetland ecology systems, um, as well as wild rice um, systems up here, uh, which are very important to um, the native communities. Um, and um, when when we start to think about the, the harm that that could come from this pipeline. Um, it, it doesn't just include, you know, the dangers that come with the ecological, you know, devastation from, from this pipeline. But when we think about this, um, it also includes my community, my, the indigenous folks um, on the reservation. Um, we use the land and we use ceremony um, to heal a lot of the, the things that come with um, the generational trauma and poverty of growing up and being indigenous on a reservation um, without being able to go out onto the land and participate in tradition and ceremony. Um, we use that as tools often to fight mental illness and addiction, which is something that our community faces very heavily and has been um, posing a great risk. And we've been seeing a lot of life loss um, these things, excuse me. Um, and so this pipeline is, um, not only a danger to our ecosystem, but a danger to the indigenous communities here. Um, and the pipeline also doesn't benefit anybody in our communities. Um, it runs from Canada through the United States and the Bad River watershed and our reservation and goes straight back into Canada where a majority of that crude is, uh, is, is processed and given back to Canada. We have a very small percentage of it that goes um, in propane back to Northern Wisconsinites. Um, but uh, we're, we're bearing a lot of the risk for very little reward. Um, and so I would just like to share with y'all um, that the Wisconsin DNR is accepting public comment on a recent draft environmental statement um, that um, 
is in regards to the recent um, proposed pipeline um, reroute of line five, which would still be in the Bad River watershed. Um, folks in support of the line are claiming that because they're moving off of the reservation that they're um, doing their part, but uh, being in the watershed is still would cause all of the same damages as being on the reservation. Um, and so Brittany just put in the chat for everybody. Um, we've created, worked with tribal guidance to create um, a really easy way to submit comments to the Wisconsin DNR and ask them to not only deny the, the draft EIS that has been submitted, um, that doesn't really cover the entirety of um, the impact that this would actually have on our communities, um, and also to deny Enbridge from, from getting a permit in Wisconsin overall. Um, we, we don't get a benefit from having a Canadian um, company in, in our lands and ruining our waters. So that is my, my story for you to share, my action that I, I hope you all will take. And I thank you all for having me on tonight. And I'm very excited to hear stories from the rest of you. Oh, ho. thank you, Jade. Um, deeply, deeply appreciate your being with us uh, this night and for presenting on this uh, really, really important issue. Uh, we will now move to Freddie, uh, whose introduction introduction you have uh, you have heard, um, and uh, and I think is ready to speak. Buenas noches. Uh, mi nombre es Freddy Carrillo y vivo en Milwaukee, en el lado sur de la ciudad. Y um, he trabajado en diferentes trabajos uh, como la construcción y agricultura, fábricas y nunca me han ofrecido como una aseguranza un tipo que o algo otra cosa que, que cubra el médico y sabemos que si ninguna aseguranza en este país no tienes um, servicio médico y um, ahora este tuve un problema hace tiempo en mi rodilla que tuve un dolor muy fuerte donde donde no podía yo ni caminar y estuve llegando a una clínica que está aquí para donde no importa el estatus pero está muy saturada por tantos latinos o eh, que vemos y, y gente sin papeles entonces um, sus, sus recomendaciones de ello era para uh, que sin una aseguranza no pude hacerme como un MRI o algo para checar y detectar el problema de mi rodilla Simplemente me estaban dando como pastillas para calmar el dolor y, y eso no arreglaba nada. Entonces ya llevo más como cuatro o cinco meses con este dolor y hasta ahora eso, bueno, eso ha afectado mucho en mi trabajo, ya que trabajo en construcción todavía y, y diariamente estoy usando mi cuerpo y necesito caminar, subir, bajar escaleras y todo. Entonces, este... Hasta ahora no, no he tenido toda una, una ayuda todavía. Y fui a otra clínica donde me habían recomendado, pero igual me dijeron lo mismo. Simplemente me dieron más pastillas para el dolor y nunca han checado exactamente el problema de raíz, qué es lo que está pasando. Y el caso me llegó un bill por 20 minutos que estuve con un doctor me llegó un bill de 170 dólares que fue todo lo que obtuve pastillas para el dolor simplemente y ahora sí como como yo aquí mis primos hermanos y vecinos habemos millones de personas que estamos aquí sin una aseguranza y sin ningún apoyo eso es todo muchas gracias Thank you, Freddie. Gracias, Freddie. Um, yeah, it's uh, 
thank you. Thank you for your for your words. And uh, it's very powerful. Uh, Brittany, uh, we'd like I'd like to introduce you now. Uh, Brittany is one of our tri chairs and um, is also uh, like many of us an impacted individual and uh, will be uh, speaking on uh, uh, dental care, uh, which I think many of us can can relate with. Thank you for for doing this. Yeah. <laughs> This is um, definitely something that's hard for me to talk about. So um, <clears throat> growing up in poverty, I didn't have access to routine dental care from the time I was born. My first experience at a dentist was at the age of three when I had to have my two top front teeth extracted due to bottle rot. My mother who struggled with addiction and mental health issues had kept me on a bottle up until that day causing my teeth to literally decay in my mouth to the point that they nearly turned black. Though my life changed for the better when my dad gained sole custody of me, poverty and the lack of access to our basic healthcare rights persisted. Struggling for years, trying to make a living, working multiple low-wage jobs, my dad took on a load, a load of student loan debt and went to college. After graduating in 2001, he got a job as a computer technician at a school district. Through this new job, he received health insurance, but the premiums were so high that he couldn't afford to add dental for us. And to this day, to this very day, my dad has never had dental coverage in his entire life. As for myself, since the age of 18, I have teetered back and forth between the qualification limits for Medicaid. Because of this, I also haven't had consistent, reliable access to health or dental care in my adult life and have lived in constant fear of losing my benefits. <clears throat> in March of 2020, the business I co-owned was deemed non-essential and we were forced to temporarily close. With this came reduced hours and pay, meaning I would again qualify for Badger Care. And keep in mind, um, before the closure, I had been making $7.25 an hour, minimum wage, 40 hours a week. Um, and that put me over the income limit for a single person with no children. Last year, after saving my tax return and stimulus checks and spending $1,500 out of pocket to have a recommended deep cleaning done at a periodontist, I developed an infection in one of my bottom front teeth. Less than three weeks later, that tooth had to be removed and due to severe bone loss, which is no doubt directly related to my lack of access to dental care growing up, another tooth next to it had to be removed in December. Now at the age of 35, I have a partial denture where my front bottom teeth should be because I cannot afford the $17,000 it would cost to get an implant supported bridge. Additionally, I'm at risk of losing both my health insurance and dental coverage next month when the federal health emergency ends, a day that I have been dreading for the last two years. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, I believe we are through our uh, testifiers, am I, am I correct? You are. Okay, well, Sally, it is uh it's your show again <laughs> okay um and i'm going to pause for a quick interpretation check um i think i think we're on anna interpreting now just want to make sure we're all on the same page thank you okay thank you sarah a heartfelt thank you to all the testifiers for joining us tonight. Thank you all for being so open about how the issues of de environmental degradation of water, obstruction of voting rights, and the denial of health care have affected you. It inspires us to work harder. We appreciate each of you and are so grateful to have you all stand alongside us in this fight. We know that there are many stories of how systemic racism, 
systemic poverty, militarism, environmental issues, and moral blindness to suffering have affected those of you here tonight. The Wisconsin Poor People's Campaign has an ongoing project called We Won't Be Silent Anymore, which uplifts the voices and shares the struggles of Wisconsinites from across the state. Visit the link in the chat below to check out our interactive map. View each of the two to three minute long testimonies that have been collected and find out more about how to tell your own story. We'll now break into random groups of three or four to get to know each other a little better and talk about what we hear, heard tonight from Reverend Theo Harris and the testimonies, what we're taking away from it, and how we can use this to build our movement. We'll see you all back here soon. And really quick before we go into the breakouts, um, when we come back, we're gonna be talking about some like amazing ways that you all can get involved with the PPC um, and some more information on uh, the um, March 28th event coming up soon in Madison. So be sure to come back.